Uh oh. Okay, we'll start with this, another rigorous back and forth between Ryan Garcia and Bill Haney. Bill said, man, I'm hearing all this yapping from lying Ryan, who wasn't even signed up for random testing yet, screaming from the mountaintop like he's got a belt to back it up, but let's keep it real. Ryan responded by saying, I didn't need a belt to whoop your son's ass like he stole something. Turn the page, this arc is done. Goal was to put a whooping on your son, I did, I know in my heart, I never took steroids. However, it showed up in my system is a mystery. What is a little weird though is how your other son knew about the testing before the public, before you, and even before VADA testing, which your bitch ass never acknowledges. Very fishy. But who cares? I'm over it. I'm trying to continue my career and move on. Devin is not on my level and never will be. Dropped three times and had his face all beat up. It's really not that weird that Devin's brother suspected that Ryan was on PEDS because Javante Davis suspected that Ryan was on PEDS. He has since changed his tune, but he was the first. He was the first to say he suspects Ryan is doping. Ryan doesn't acknowledge it, neither do Ryan's fans. Who can play that game? Think about it this way. Devin Haney was widely favored to beat Ryan Garcia going into that fight. He was favored by the boxing fans, the bookmakers. Most people in boxing thought that Devin would win. So ask yourself a question. If Ryan Garcia is implying that Devin Haney somehow tainted his samples. Why would he have to? Before the fight, beforehand, why would Devin Haney taint his samples in a fight that he's widely favored to win by everyone? That doesn't even make sense. Nothing about what Ryan says makes sense. People just go with it because they're attracted to him. I'm gonna pull no punches on these weirdos. The only people backing Ryan Garcia's version of the story are content creators looking to siphon followers from him. Clout chases. And guys that want to sleep with him. Gross. Devin Haney tainted your samples ahead of the fight before you beat him to accomplish what? Bill Haney continued, Ryan, you can't win a championship belt, so you wrap a waist belt around your arm and shoot Osterin instead. The fans in the sport deserve better than your excuses. If you're so confident you didn't cheat, show us the receipts and prove it. You've quit before, so nothing surprises me about you. Devin never, ever quits. We're not letting this slide. Do you think a day will come that Ryan Garcia sees himself crowned a bona fide world champion at 147 or 154, can he win a belt from someone? I think his best bet to win a belt at 147 would have to be Mario Barrios, but he's otherwise preoccupied. He's boxing on the undercard of Jake Paul versus Mike Tyson. Ryan hasn't really won a belt yet. A full belt, a full world title. That's what Bill is pointing out. That's what Ryan is responding to, saying, does it have to be your precious Vada Bill? or can it be any organization? There is more than one anti-doping agency. You can use USADA, you can use drug-free sport. It's gotta be a WADA accredited lab though, for the optics of it. If you really want people to believe you're innocent, it's gotta be a WADA accredited lab. The band list that VADA uses, or USADA, or drug-free sport, it's all based on WADA, the world anti-doping agency, and their guidelines, their definitions. Bill continued, Lying Ryan wants to fight the manager, the trainer, the father, anyone but the guy he cheated. You're running from real accountability. How about proving you're clean with random testing before talking about real fights? No belts, no legacy, 
just excuses. So the other day, Bill. Bill challenged Ryan Garcia to sign up for anti-doping testing and he gave him a 48-hour deadline. Ryan responded by saying he doesn't have to listen to anything Bill says. Now this is after Ryan Garcia said on his TikTok that he's getting ready for the Devin Haney rematch and he's training. Bill responded by challenging him to sign up for VADA. Ryan responded by not signing up for VADA. Make of that what you will. Bill continued, Oscar, stop bullshit. Your clapback took a week and it's still broken. You answered no questions. Ryan said he paid 1.5 mil for the weight issue, but we only got 600,000. Plus, Golden Boy received 1 million in damages, leaving 900,000 unaccounted for. If you want, I'll come over and pick up the 1.9 million right now. Fighters and fans deserve transparency. Settle this the right way. There are no heroes in this story. I don't feel that there are any heroes in this story. Devin is embarrassing and Ryan is repugnant. Repulsive. He's everything that's wrong with boxing. But this... This is what the American populace gravitates towards, these kinds of disruptive and dysfunctional people, as they are a reflection of the population. The populace. There is some truth to what Bill is saying, that Ryan doesn't have a legacy. He wasn't a champion at 135. He's not one now at 140. The best guy you ever beat, you had to blow the weight to do it, and you tested positive for peds immediately afterwards. There are some people that are giving you a pass on all of this but there are others that are not. And if this is the only solid fighter that you ever beat, if this is all you ever do in your career, and this is how it all panned out, that's no legacy. They might be enamored with you now, in the moment, but they're like druggies looking for the next hit. You think you're invincible like they won't get tired of playing with you. Earmark of your generation is its low attention span. And poor work ethic. What I think is, uh, Ryan is not a good fighter. He doesn't have a legacy in the sport right now. He's just a kid who's popular right now. Right now. I don't get the sense that based on what he's done so far, he can be remembered like a Fernando Vargas or Renasca De La Hoya because those fighters had legacies. He doesn't. He's like a Vine influencer. You guys remember Vine. Do it for the Vine. And it was fun for a time. A lot of people had fun with it. And then it fizzled out. People moved on. Some of the content creators found other kinds of content to create on other platforms some didn't and faded away i just feel like that could be ryan if he doesn't add something substantial to his quote-unquote legacy because so far he hasn't really done anything oh sure it's fun that he beat devin now but in a couple of years people might not care your best win is a win where you blew the weight and tested positive for a banned substance what kind of legacy is that no legacy at all nevertheless it's these kinds of disruptive and dysfunctional people that the american populace is more interested in, so there is still a lot of money in a Garcia versus Haney rematch if it happens. I'm really not that interested in this kind of garbage. This is just another story in the sport of boxing, something else that's going on. I don't actually give a shit about either side. In men's super lightweight news, Bob Arum on Teofimo Lopez claiming that his contract with Top Rank is invalid. Teofimo sometimes acts like he's got a screw loose. I like the kid, but I can't figure him out. And he makes no logical sense. He signed an extension with us first, with the Jose Pedraza fight that didn't happen. And then, when we did another fight with Sandor Martin, he signed the same extension. So it's there in black and white. I assume he showed the lawyer the first contract and not the second. Dealing with T.L. Fimo is like dealing with Alice in Wonderland. It's what it's like. T.L. Fimo in his fashion has a way of making otherwise uncomplicated situations complicated. And we've talked about it to no end here on the channel. The crooks of it is that Teofimo doesn't seem to want to finish out his deal at top rank, likely because he's afraid that he'll lose before the deal is done. And if he loses before the deal is done and becomes a free agent afterwards, that takes away all his bargaining power. He sees that Devin Haney achieved free agency, Shakur Stevenson achieved free agency, but they did so by seeing out the life of the deal. They didn't try to end it prematurely maturely the way that he has and we've known for some years now that he is unhappy at top rank for a number of reasons but that's the gist of it he wants to terminate the deal prematurely he's trying to find a way out a loophole a technicality a something because he's afraid he's gonna lose his next fight don't forget what they wanted to do 
last month, they wanted to put him in the ring with Brian Norman. T.O. killed that fight. To do absolutely nothing and fight absolutely no one. The way he's been Ooh. occupying his time is doing the rounds on social media, podcast after podcast instead of a fight, squandering his time. Call out after baseless call out, knowing that he's still under contract with Top Rank. He's not at liberty to move around. He's not at liberty to do whatever he wants. And this is what I've pointed out in episode after episode to no end. The people who don't seem to want to understand. A different angle of this same conversation. Teofimo knows what his limitations are. He's struggled enough in enough fights that his bad performances outnumber his good ones. His good ones against Vasil Lomachenko and Josh Taylor are outweighed by how he looked with George Cambosos, how he looked with Sandor Martin, how he looked with Jermaine Ortiz, and Steve Claggett. He struggled. This is what a fighter does when he smells a loss coming. This is what a fighter does when he knows he can't really hack it. He looks for a way out. Wouldn't it be easier to just see out the life of the deal and achieve free agency that way? And no, not if you're Teofimo, because if you're Teofimo, you might lose. Why are you such a pain in the ass? Being honest with you, I am growing less and less concerned with the career of Teofimo Lopez as time progresses because it's clear there's nothing to be excited about there. He's not going to unify the super lightweight division. In all likelihood, he's going to be just as careful as a welterweight. You say that it's business, you pretend that it's business, but it's not. How often business is brought up in the American boxing scene as code for cowardice. Teofimo is at a point to where I wouldn't even trust him to beat Alberto Puello for his WBC. Mm -mm. He's hit a ceiling and underneath it all, I think he knows that, which is why he's being such a pain in the ass. What it reminds me of is when Mikey Garcia tried to do the exact same thing many, many years ago. He tried to terminate his contract with Top Rank early and it ended up costing him two or three years. People tend to forget that in between the time he has it out with Top Rank and he migrated over to the PBC, there were about three years in there that he lost. And time is the one thing you don't get back. And why did he want to terminate the deal? Why did he want to leave? I remember it being because Top Rank wanted him to fight either Yuri Orkis Gamboa when Gamboa was Gamboa or Terence Crawford. It's the same situation with Teofimo. It's the exact same situation. He knows if he sees out the life of the deal, he might take a loss. And if he takes a loss, that hurts his bargaining power. It hurts his stock. He wants to bail before it comes to that. It's the same shit. But boxing fans aren't supposed to be bogged down by this many contractual issues between fighters and their promoters. What part of this is entertaining to you, the consumer, the customer? What about any of this is supposed to endear Teofimo Lopez to the pay in public? What? All it does is make him seem like a pain in the ass. That you can never make a fight for this kid without there being a problem. An issue. And underneath it all, the real issue is, he's just not that good. In men's junior middleweight news, Oscar De La Hoya took to his social media yesterday and stated Virgil Ortiz versus Errol Spence Jr., Cowboy Stadium, next year. Huh? To which veteran kiss-ass Ellie Sekback stated, that would be fire. The American boxing scene continues to stoop to new lows. I mean, that's how desperate the situation is becoming in America, that Oscar De La Hoya can openly make a suggestion like this one, knowing what the circumstances are, that Errol got beat within an inch of his life in his last fight, and that was over a year ago. He hasn't even come back yet. How is that the fight to make? Why aren't more people lambasting him for even making this suggestion, and why does Oscar feel comfortable enough? to make this suggestion. Why does Ellie think it's fire? You see, stuff like this is why I don't romanticize the sport of boxing, the boxes, or the people in it. Because when you take a good long look, they're just brazen opportunists. Shameless. After the performance that Virgil put on with Sergei Bohachuk in a fight that many people feel he lost, I wondered, who would he fight next? Because he's campaigning as a junior middleweight now, and that's a deep division. There's a lot of potential banana skins. Tim Zhu slipped on one this weekend. And what was his bid to become a two-time junior middleweight champion? Pay attention that Bakram Mertazaliev put on a signature performance, a devastating win, and instead of recommending that Virgil fight him, Oscar recommends he fights a guy coming off a loss. 
a devastating loss that was over a year ago. Huh? There are three champions at this weight. Sebastian Fundora is one, Terence Crawford is another, and then there is Bakram Murtazaliev. And instead of making the recommendation that Virgil fight one of them next year, look at who he's targeting. Like, you don't know why. Used to say that boxing is the noble sport, the noble art. There's nothing noble about this suggestion. It's very obvious why Asuka would take the time out to make a recommendation like this, why he would be looking to make a fight like this instead of some of the other better fights with the better fighters at the weight. Errol hasn't even fought as a junior middle yet. Coward. That is... He hasn't accomplished anything at the weight yet. We don't know what the man has left. You look at the beating that Tim Zhu took this weekend, and that's a beating akin to the one that Errol took over a year ago. Knocked down three times and stopped. Coward. Who is? Oscar De La Hoya. He wants to wrap Virgil Ortiz in a protective cocoon because he knows that he struggled in his last fight. He knows that there are people out there saying he should have lost. So in my previous video, I talked about Bakram Mertesaliev's call out after the Tim Zhu fight, of all these guys at 154, I talked about how they're not going to want to fight him. Do you see? This post from Oscar De La Hoya is from yesterday. It's from yesterday. He knows about the fight the same as everybody else in boxing. Is he making the recommendation that Virgil fight Bakram? No. Didn't I tell you that he wouldn't? I am so sick of people throwing Errol Spence Jr.'s name around like he doesn't have his foot halfway out the door, like he's not contemplating retirement. Didn't Errol say that the next time we see him in the ring might be the last time we see him? Mm -hmm. Anybody, everybody looking at Errol Spence Jr. as a potential opponent option in the coming year is looking for the low-hanging fruit. They're looking for an easy fight, an easy night, whether it's Sebastian Fundora or Oscar De La Hoya on behalf of Virgil. Cowards. Yeah, 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 Virgil's a good kid, but at the end of the day, Oscar De La Hoya promotes him. He's making these suggestions on your behalf. So you're guilty. Not Terrence Crawford. Even though Oscar's working with Turkey LL Sheik and everybody knows Turkey's invested in Terrence, he's not making the suggestion that Virgil fight Terrence. He's making the suggestion suggestion that he fight the guy Terrence beat up. And you don't see anything wrong with that. It's just a lot of opportunists, a lot of parasites, and a lot of cowards in the American boxing scene. There is no other way to describe it. You know exactly why you want to make Ortiz versus Spence next year. We all do. I'm not going to beat around the bush. I'm not one of these content creators that relies on access to fighters or their teams to create content. I don't need it. I can sit back and point out how you're scared to match Virgil Tough because of his last fight, because of how he looked. Why else would you be looking at Spence? For what? It's obvious what. He's low-hanging fruit. You want to give Virgil a lighter touch. 154 is one of the deeper divisions in all of boxing. You're not proposing that Virgil fight the winner of Bohachuk versus Madrimov or challenge for an alphabet title against one of the three champions at the weight. Bear in mind, Virgil is WBC interim champion. That's a segue for a Fundora fight. And instead of making the recommendation that he fight Fundora, look at what he recommends. <laughs> American boxing and American boxers just ain't what they used to be. This is a disgrace. Though you won't see many in the American media pointing it out how tactless this suggestion is because they're all sycophants looking for access. It's disgusting. Me strictly American fighters and American boxing involving Americans. It's almost unwatchable. It's really just the foreign guys that want to fight in real fights against real fighters. Roll the dice, it's the foreign guys that have my attention. American boxing? American boxing is a joke.